Okay, everybody, so today we're looking at London by William Blake. This is one of the pre-19th century poems from the GCSE AQA Power and Conflict Anthology. So the first thing I want to look at is, as always, I want to look at the title. The title of the poem, as we know, is London. And when we think about London, we need to think of a few things. First of all, it is the capital city of England. Okay, it's quite, it's quite diverse and it has a huge population. And not a lot has actually changed about that since William's Blake, William Blake's time. It's always been like that. So what we are going to do is I'm going to read the poem for you now. And then I'm going to have a look at the context and the structure before we go back and actually look at the poem line by line. Okay? So, I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow. A mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban. The mind-forged manacles I hear, how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blast the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Okay, so it's quite a short poem, so I'm going to go to the bottom of my sheet now to talk about the context. So... William Blake, ridiculously famous poet from the 1700s. Okay, so main things to know about William Blake. He was considered to be a radical thinker. And that means that his ideas were considered a little bit crazy and out there. And it wasn't just about politics, it was about religion as well. He was a very religious man, but he felt that the way religion was being run in the country was not good. He firmly felt that things needed to change. Okay? So he didn't agree with church politics. Because at the time... It was fairly easy, politics, it was fairly easy to get the church to say that you were a good person just by slipping them a few, a few coins. He was also, he wasn't just a poet, he was an artist. He was in fact an engraver. And if you look this poem up online, you will find actually the original print. And it's all beautifully, it's all beautifully presented. Okay, he actually created a type of printing that enabled more um, pamphlets to be released. And he wrote loads about politics as well as writing poetry. So, the structure of the poem. I'm just going to bring the poem back into view very briefly and then I'm going to go back down to the bottom. Because the structure of the poem, the way it's put together. Okay, it is a simple four stanza, four line poem. Okay, so we have a regular structure. Okay, so we have four stanzas, each with four lines. Okay, we have a regular rhythm. And a regular rhyme. Can anybody identify what the rhyme scheme is? How, where does the rhyme come in? Yeah, it's every other line. Okay, it's every other line. Oh, sorry. And we could argue, because remember, we always have to think about why these things are there. Because this poem is so structured, okay, we could argue that it's quite restrained. 
Okay, and when we think about the word manacles in the poem, the idea of it maybe being enslaved. And it's, it's really interesting to look at the structure of a poem because more often than not, it kind of gets left to the wayside and we don't really talk about it. But if we do talk about it, we can often see echoes of the, the words in the poem actually in the structure. Okay, so we're going to go back up to the top now and we're going to have a little bit of a look at each stanza and each line. Ooh. Okay, so... I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow. A mark in every face I meet. Marks of weakness, marks of woe. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is chartered. Now it's quite clear we've got repetition there. Okay. And repetition, as we know, is often there to emphasise things. Now, we talked last lesson. Can anybody remember what chartered means? Yes? Uh, enslaved? Yeah, enslaved or owned. Okay. So, when we think about this, it's basically saying that London isn't free. It is owned. And when you consider... Okay, that London being not free is owned. It's the idea that the poor, so not just the buildings are owned by people, but the very people that live there can't make their own free choices. Can't make their own free choices and are focused on doing what they have to do. They have no choices. Near where the chartered Thames does flow. And when you think about the flow of the Thames... You know, it's really wiggly, isn't it? So even that wiggly shape isn't free. It's all owned. It's all enslaved. A mark in every face I meet. Marks of weakness, marks of woe. Now there are two ways to look at mark. Because there are two different versions here. When he says mark in the third line of the stanza, it means notice. However, marks of woe, what, what might a mark of woe, unhappiness mean? Yeah? That is very sad. Yeah, but it's, what, what evidence could you see on someone's face to show that they have been, uh, they're unhappy? Expression. Like their facial expressions and Lee? Oh, crying. Yeah, crying. okay. So their facial expressions, um, tear stains... Okay. What about marks of weakness? Yeah. Uh, they might have bruises on their face. Or yeah. Very dirty. Yeah. Okay. It could be bruising. The other thing is, London was full of disease at this point in time, so it could actually be marks of disease such as, um, I don't know whether any of you guys ever had chicken pox as a child, but quite a few people have like chicken pox scars that are left over from when um, they picked at a spot. And they, they would have had pock marks on their faces to show disease. Okay, so let's look at the second stanza now. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. So the first thing we're obviously going to be looking at here is that repetition of every. He likes his... It's a very simple poem, but it's fairly full of meaning, okay? So if it's in every cry of every man, so it's men, infants, children, every voice, where is misery? It's everywhere. So misery is everywhere. Okay? And we've not just got adults, we've got children. Children that don't even know what's going on. And we've got fear as well. 
Okay? This is not a nice place to be. Now, can... Uh, la, 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 la. You can't really see the brain. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a bit, uh, a bit blind now. Okay, I'll, st I'll stay clear of the uh, green now. Can anybody remember what ban meant from last lesson? Um, yeah. Um, at the back. Yeah. Can you remember? Uh, announcement. Yes, what good. So it's an announcement. Okay. So anytime somebody says anything, we get this. He says, the mind forged manacles I hear. Now, we know that manacles are chains. Okay. So, what does mind forged mean? Lee? No, if something's forged, it's created. So this is created by the mind. So what are these chains? Chains created by the mind. What might that suggest? Yeah? Uh, society's, um, like, you uh, of poor people. And how it pushes, you know, poor people back. Yeah, and not just the views of people about the poor but also the views of the poor themselves. So are they actually create, are these physical things created by the mind? No, they're not, so it's a metaphor. So this metaphor, okay, the idea that even their thoughts are chained. And it's, uh, they're handcuffed by their own thinking. So, it's not just the fact that they are, you know, it's not people desperate to get out and be wonderful, moral, lovely human beings, but they can't because the rich people are stopping them. Their minds are so entrenched in this idea that because we're because we're poor, we must be evil, we must be badly behaved. That that's what they are, and it's actually quite reminiscent of the idea of the word ignorance in a Christmas Carol, where Scrooge base, uh, Scrooge is shown that the poor are ignorant, but they're ignorant because they have no choice. Okay, and it's the same idea here. Okay. So moving on to stanza three, almost there. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier sigh runs in blood down palace walls. So first of all, we've got more of that misery. Yeah? The idea, do you remember we were talking about in every cry? So we've got more of that there. Obviously, chimney sweepers. How old were chimney sweepers at this point in time? Oh, they were kids, weren't they? So this is children. So he's talking about children crying, okay? Every blackening church appalls. Okay, so why might the church, why, or why might a church be blackening? There's two reasons why. There's a literal meaning and there's a metaphorical meaning. So literally, industrial revolution, why might the church's walls be turning black? Casper? Yeah. So first reason is smog, because William Blake firmly believed in the power of nature as well. And the second reason, why might a church metaphorically be blackening? Funeral. People's, people's view on religion is fading. Possibly. How okay. might the church be behaving? Naughty. Yeah. The church isn't doing what it should be doing. Okay? So we have this idea of corruption within the church because when things go black somebody mentioned funerals and rotting and it's that sort of idea the church is rotting from the inside out it is not a good establishment remember William Blake felt that the church politics were wrong okay so it's that idea of corruption okay so a pause we know means awful uh, let's find another pen that one okay so Hey, William Blake himself is appalled by this. He, it, he says it's disgusting. He's really upset by it. 
and the hapless soldier sighs. Okay, so we know that hapless means hopeless. Okay. And then we've got soldier's sigh. Can anybody tell me anything about the way those words sound together? I'm going to use the green pen again. It's, yeah, it's alliteration. It's actually a posh form of alliteration called sibilance, which is about S's. Okay, so it's repeated S's. And it's kind of, it's almost, almost onomatopoeic because it actually sounds like somebody sighing, okay? Okay, runs in blood down palace walls. Now, obviously, Buckingham Palace's walls are not actually running with blood. But yes, yeah, so it's a metaphor. Why? Why might the walls of Buckingham Palace run with metaphorical blood? Who's keeping the king or queen there? Yeah, the soldiers. Yeah? Not quite. Okay, but it's that idea that the people who are in power are kept there by the soldiers that are working for them, Lee. And the soldiers, uh, the soldiers are basically dying. Yeah, they're dying, exactly. The soldiers are dying for the British Empire. At this point in time, the British Empire was just being born, it was just being created, and um, the empire was built on violence and death, okay? People in power are there through violence and death. that together in a minute. Mm. Box that together, otherwise you can't see it. Mm. Okay, so we've got this idea here because the poor aren't getting anything out of this as well. The poor are not getting anything out of this. Mm. So they are dying to keep the, um, the king in charge, but nothing's happening. It's not changing. It's not helping them. And then this last stanza. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Okay, so first of all, okay, we know that a harlot is a prostitute. Okay, now, youthful. A lot of prostitutes at this time were very young. If any of you have ever seen the musical Oliver or have watched anything about Oliver Twist, the character of Nancy in Oliver in the, in the film, the musical, she's about 20. In the book, she's about 13. Okay? 13? Yep. Young women, it was, the, it was the easiest way and often the safest way to make money when you couldn't get a job. So... Yes. Yes, that's my whole point. Okay, it wasn't allowed, but the point is, is that nobody was that nobody was trying to stop it because there was nobody that, that bothered. It was the only way that people could have uh, people could make money. So, and of course, okay, so we're, uh, young women. But because. There was very little, in fact, there was no real protection from not just pregnancy, but also STIs. The harlot's curse is actually a specific thing. It's an STI called syphilis. Now, can I spell this? Yes, I can. Now, syphilis was an absolutely vile illness. Still around today, it can be cured by antibiotics. But syphilis would do things like eat, um, it, the actual bacteria would eat your brain. And so it would send people mad. And so if you caught it in the 1700s and 1800s, it was incurable. And so it was called the harlot's curse because it was usually spread, unsurprisingly, 
by prostitutes and the men that they slept with. And it can be transmitted to a child, which is why blast the newborn infant's tears. So a, a baby could be born with syphilis. Okay? So blast the newborn infant's tear. Okay? So... So babies were born with syphilis. Okay, it's absolutely horrible. And then, of course, blights the, with plagues the marriage curse. Now, this is really, really miserable, this last line, because not only is the harlot's curse affecting the prostitutes and the people um, that sleep with prostitutes, okay, it's also spoiling marriage okay so blights with plague so spoils with disease so being married because london was so corrupt and so um full of immoral behavior majority of men according to william blake were using prostitutes and then they would come home and they would spread that curse to their wives and which is why we have, and I'm going to do this in two different colours, marriage and hearse put together. Now, what's a hearse? A coffin. It's a funeral car. It's a, fu it's a car. It's a cart or a car vehicle that is used to take somebody to death. Um, marriage, on the other hand, what's marriage to do with? Getting together. Family, life, okay? So if we've got life and death put next to each other, what sort of device is that? Can anybody remember? Give us an O. On the back of here. Oxymoron. Oxymoron. You were close. Okay, it's an oxymoron, okay? And it's another metaphor. Because it puts life to, um, with death, okay? And it shows us that life is over and corrupted before it begins. Okay. It's a thoroughly miserable poem. William Blake was not a massive fan of London, as you can imagine. He was, ve he was in favour of um, countryside and he was in favour of people. Uh, his, his religious beliefs were very much against the, um, the church. He believed the church was horrendously corrupt. And so this particular poem shows all of his feelings about the corruption that was there. Lovely short poem, nice and quick, very good for comparing with pretty much any of the poems that are to do with corruption and well worth learning. Okay, thank you very much. I will see you again soon.